what happened at the town council meeting Monday night. Have you heard about the agenda items, the decisions the town council made and what they did Monday? Have you read about it? Neither have I. Why? Because nobody's reporting it. Right? Okay, we know that. Rick Mercer knows that. We got a problem with that, and that's what this next session is about. How, as a community, are we to get our local news? So Rick is going to uh, moderate this. Rick is our communications manager for the town. Before joining us in Garner, Rick spent nearly a decade in the newspaper business writing and editing. He's been with newspapers in Virginia, Alabama, and Clayton. He's been a freelance journalist for a Jean's France Press. He told me I could call that AFP. I said, why am I going to call it AFP when I can say a Jean's Franz Press, right? He's also been a contributor for um, the Knight Ritter Tribune, Associated Press, Boston Globe. He has reported from all over the world. He is now reporting from Main Street in Garner. Please welcome, I'm into this French thing now. Please, please welcome Rick Mercier. Hey, good afternoon, y'all. Um, I'm, I'm both excited and, and a little sad to be here uh, talking about this. This is a, obviously a topic that's important to our community, to any community across America. Um, you know, I have a newspaper background, so I care passionately about this. Um, I now serve as the communications manager for the, the town of Garner government, so I care passionately about getting news and information out and know that it plays an integral role to to uh, reinforcing the, the credibility and the trust that people have in, in their government. Um, but I also know that, uh, you know, there's, there's business uh, factors to consider and uh, demographic changes, technological changes, and, uh, and those have uh, dramatically impacted uh, newspapers uh, over the past now about decade. And I wanted to show, I had sent Neil this slide and he said, boy, doesn't that tell the story? And I was wondering if we could pop that up now. Um, so what this shows, obviously, is uh, newspaper advertising revenue over time, over um, 60 years. And you can see uh, things are going pretty well uh, during the 80s, 90s, even up to early 2000. Um, sort of the glory days seem like things are going well and they had the infancy of the, the internet. Um, and uh, you know, around that time, I can recall newspapers, we were f trying to figure out, well, how are we going to use this new tool, and uh, you know, do we give it away, and is it gonna, are people going to not read the, the newspaper if we, if we give it away on the internet, and, um, but, but not really, uh, we weren't quite prepared for the, uh, the, what, what was about to come, the sort of the tsunami and the, the structural crisis that we uh, came to face, and you can see, you know, they're about 2004, 2005, it's a, it's a cliff drop, it, it, uh, it's a cliff. And um, that's sort of what, what, what has happened to the industry at large. And, and, you know, newspapers, of course, they collect some money from our subscriptions, but really all depend on the, the advertising revenue. Is that, that's, that's right, John? I that's mean, that's, a, big, that's, that's a big part of it. That's a big part of it. And when that falls off the cliff, as all y'all business folks know, if you Lose, lose a revenue source like that, or if you see it in such a steep, dramatic decline, um, there's, there's stuff you got to do to adjust. Uh, and, and so that's why we're here today, really. Um, we have a great panel. Um, we're getting a lot of attention nationally and internationally, uh, I might say. Um, first of all, we have uh, Mr. Craig Anderson on our far right. He is the project director for the Center for Innovation and Sustainability in Local Media at the UNC School of Media and Journalism in Chapel Hill. He's responsible for overseeing day-to-day -day operations and an array of outreach, strategic planning, and research support at that center. Uh, an entertainment industry veteran, Craig recently re relocated from LA, uh, where he produced a wide variety of projects, including uh, television episodes, documentaries, branded content, and commercials. Uh, and they're doing some important work over there at UNC Chapel Hill about the future of local journalism. Y'all got a, a shout out recently in a, a Washington Post article about we're talking about some of the things that we're going to talk about. Um, next we have, uh, I don't even know how to, ref to, to what to call you, but um, I, that, I'm going to call you Seth. Seth Crossno? Yeah. Uh, Seth is the creator of the itbinsider.com 
blog, website, and uh, its associated social media accounts, which are all very popular and informative and entertaining. And if um, you aren't following him by any of those means, you really should. Um, in 2007, using the pen name William Needham Finley IV, he began a satirical blog focused on the inside the Beltline culture in Raleigh. Um, and it's since evolved to, be, to include actual reporting uh, on news and development. And yeah, I think you're focusing a lot on development news inside the Beltline and in Raleigh these days. Uh, and he still does a lot of the humorous uh, satirical articles uh, as well. Last year, he formed his own company and he's been working full time to grow the site and his social media channels and bring on sponsors and advertisers. And you recently hired, you were able to hire someone and she is here to report on the event. So we, we thank you for that. So that's a, a kind of a sign of the times. And then lastly, we have Mr. John Drescher. Uh, John, you may recognize him or at least know his name. He's the executive editor of the News and Observer. John grew up in Raleigh and is a graduate of UNC Chapel Hill and of Duke University. In addition to working at the NNO, he has also been a reporter and editor at the Charlotte Observer uh, and was managing editor at the State Newspaper in Columbia, South Carolina. Uh, he was named executive editor of the NNO in 2007. He's the seventh person to hold that job, only the seventh, since the newspaper was launched back in 1894. Uh, he and his wife have three daughters, each of whom graduated from Wake County Public Schools. Um, so we're, we're fortunate to have you all here and I want to jump into it. Craig. We're just gonna, we're gonna start from the end and go with Craig. Can you tell us a bit about what, what the center at UNC is doing, your, your, the scope of your research, um, and uh, kind of the, some of the things you're learning about the future of local news these days? Sure. Um, as I'm sure you've seen, uh, the landscape of local media is changing, uh, and it's, it's changed immensely, especially in, the, in recent years. Uh, and we're in a climate now where information is crucial. I don't think anyone would argue that. I mean, you can turn on the TV every day, open the newspaper every day. There's a lot of, of things happening in the world. Um, but we're also facing a time when, when a lot of those legacy institutions that we've counted on to inform us um, are in danger of going away, frankly. Um, so the Center for Innovation and Sustainability in Local Media at UNC Chapel Hill, uh, we're a, we started about two years ago. We're a grant funded research center uh, supported by the Knight Foundation as well as the UNC Provost Office. Um, and we really have two sides of the center. We have the sustainability side uh, as well as the innovation side, which are both extremely popular buzzwords right now, but also vitally important to what we do. Um, on, on the sustainability side, we, we do a lot of, of research and, and investigation based around business models. Uh, advertising models, uh, building on the work of Penny Abernathy and Joanne Chiarino, who are both our night chairs um, at the school. And, and they're really doing a lot of research in, uh, you know, how this landscape is changing and what these new business models look like. Because the, you know, the newspaper of the past, the, the radio of the past, the TV of the past, our, our local media is, is really changing. And so they're looking at kind of what, what the future is and also ways to remake those legacy organizations uh, in, to make them sustainable. Uh, then on the other side of things, we have our, uh, our innovation uh, people. Uh, we support the Reese News Lab. Uh, which is headed up by Ryan Thornburg and uh, as well as Stephen King. Uh, and we, in that space, we play a lot with the, the latest storytelling tools, virtual reality, augmented reality, 360 video, um, and really look at, at how those tools can be used to present new information. Are those the tools of the future? I mean, they, they get a lot of press and a lot of hype, but is that something that you know, John should should start looking into at the NNO. Uh, we try to do some of that investigation um, where we don't have a lot of skin in the game. So if we fail, it doesn't really matter. You know, we we can do it. We can we can test it out and and see if it's going to work before we would recommend it to somebody like John. John doesn't have the you know the ability to or the the leeway to to fail, <laughs> frankly. Um, so. Uh, on top of that, we also do a lot of outreach, and we're working right now with eight media organizations throughout North Carolina, uh, radio, TV, 
uh, as well as some digital startups um, and legacy newsprint. And looking at some of their biggest challenges, and they're involved in this nationwide program, working with some coaches over the next year, uh, and taking their, their biggest challenges and working on a change management system and trying to, to shift their business models into uh, the current marketplace uh, and, and figure out ways that they can stay sustainable and, and be there to inform the populace and to, uh, you know, to do those important things that, that we've always relied on local media to do. Right, great, thanks. Um, so Seth, uh, tell us about uh, your, your, your blog, your media properties, and um, you know, what, what, your, what your vision was for them and, and, and where you, the journey you've taken in, in the past 10 years or so. Sure, so the, um, the site I run started as a, a satirical site that kind of looked at the, the inside the Beltline crowd in, in Raleigh, and I started it in 20, uh, 2007 probably right when blogs kind of originated and uh, or around that time and didn't really know what blogging or bloggers were but realized it was a good platform for uh, you know, for writing and I've always been a big fan of you know creative writing comedy humor satire and that kind of thing so I thought it'd be funny to uh, to kind of write this character's perspective of, of, uh, of Raleigh and how things were changing um, and then it eventually evolved over the years to uh, what it is now, where we have a mix of satirical news stories, but then also a development beat where uh, one of my freelance writers covers, you know, the actual news going on in Raleigh. And so, um, uh, after ten years, I've been <coughs> doing it for uh, a full-time job as of November. So um, it's been going well since then, but it's definitely challenging, and I I don't envy being. Uh, in the position of like a an actual you know newspaper or media company because um, I know that's a tough job right now but uh, but yeah you know our goal was to have fun with it and, and be entertaining and um, uh, we've I also manage all the social media accounts that come with that so you know people's attention spans are shrinking um, and sometimes it's easier to put a funny picture up on Instagram than it is to write a thousand word you know, article that I would rather do, you know, because I enjoy writing, but, you know, you have to adapt and the times are changing, so we also have to be present on Instagram and Twitter and Facebook and all these different things, so, um, but like I said, the goal is to have fun with it and be informative and not be too, you know, clickbaity or anything like that, you know, we do about two to three stories a week, um, and we'd love to increase that as long as the, uh, you know, the quality doesn't go down, so. Well, you know, and we do kind of live in the age of memes and clickbait and shortened attention spans. Uh, and that brings us to John and the NNO and the, what are or were the community newspapers. Um, you've written a couple of columns lately kind of laying out the NNO strategies moving forward, one of which was yesterday. Thank you for that, the timeliness of that. Um, do you want to kind of talk about some of the, the things you covered in, in those columns? Well, we're a, we're a business. And uh, we're a different kind of business because we're a public service journalism um, company, but we're still a business. At the end, at the end of the day, we are not a, n a nonprofit. You know, we, we need to uh, make money. And for a long time, um, uh, print newspapers were a highly profitable business. They were sometimes called the most legal profitable business in America. Uh, but as the chart you saw a little while ago showed you, um, our, our world has been disrupted, to use a, uh, a modern term. Most of the financial success of newspapers was due to print advertising. And um, most of that's gone away. Uh, first, you saw classifieds go away. For many of the people in this room, you know, if you wanted to uh, sell an automobile or, or some old golf clubs or whatever, you went to your local newspaper uh, classified ads. Well, Craigslist completely disrupted that, and then, um, and then a lot of advertisers moved away from print and towards digital. So um, historically, uh, advertising had paid most of the bills at print newspaper, and a lot of that advertising has gone away. 
So we have to adapt, you know, for those of you who uh, run businesses, you, you know what it's like, you, you have to adapt to your change in, changing market conditions. I never thought, you know, as a, as a journalism major a long time ago at Chapel Hill, I never thought I'd be uh, so focused on the business side of our operation, but it's just kind of the reality of, uh, of where we are now in, in the news business. Um, so I did have, I, I've written a couple times recently about um, the changes at the NO, including one uh, a couple days ago. It's interesting, um, we, as, as with all of our work, we put it online first. It went online Tuesday morning, and the general reaction from the digital readers was favorably favorable, and then we put it, the story in Wednesday morning's print newspaper, and the general reaction from the print readers was unfavorable, um, which I think basically said a lot about uh, the different uh, audiences there. So um, I got, uh, I've had a lot of email the last uh, 24 hours and phone messages, and one woman left a phone message that said, I just don't want things to change. Well, if you operate a profitable business, you probably don't want things to change either, but you know that things do change, and, and we live in an era of uh, technological change that's really fast, and you have to be able to adapt to that, and, and we are changing to that. I think we've been too slow to adapt, but most of our readership now is digital. You might sometimes hear people say, well, nobody reads uh, newspapers anymore. We have far more people reading us now than we ever did before, but most of it is digital. And the question is, how do you make money off that? And, and anybody who's in the digital news and information business is struggling with that same question about how do you make money off digital? Because our, our digital advertising is going up. That graphic didn't show digital advertising alone. It showed digital and print advertising together. But the print advertising is going down. The digital advertising is going up. But digital advertising is nowhere near as lucrative as print advertising. And, and that's really been the core of the business problem that we have. But eventually those lines will cross and we'll get back into growth mode, but we're not quite there yet. So eventually those lines will cross. That's sounding very hopeful. Um, you know, we teased, we kind of teased or promoted this conference by asking, is Garner becoming a news desert? There was that Washington Post article I referenced uh, the lead in that article is very interesting. Lots of newsworthy things happen in this city of nearly 30,000 people. It's just that many of them don't make the local news. Uh, sound familiar? Uh, we do the same things that, uh, in this city that everyone else does, said the mayor. We just don't seem to get the same attention. Uh, and then it went on to say, in many respects, this town, which is East Palo Alto, California, um, is a news desert. Uh, a community overlooked, if not entirely ignored by the media. So, Craig, I know we talked on the phone and, um, you know, I've done a little reading in preparation for today. There's this term news desert and, you know, is that, is that what we are here in Garner or is there something a little more nuanced to describe what we are, especially given our proximity to Raleigh? I think, yeah, the news desert thing is, uh, it's a term that was coined um, probably 10 years ago. Uh, and very similar to some of you might have heard of like food deserts happens a lot in, in metro areas where there's a lack of grocery stores, a lack of access to fresh food. Similar to that in, on the news side of things, a news desert is this community that, a community that has lost, basically lost its, its news sources. Um, I think the good news is, and I can tell you like here in Garner, I would not call this a news desert. It may seem like you don't know everything that's going on and, and you know, some of the coverage might have dropped back from, from the NNO. Uh, the TV stations may not cover as much as you would like. Um, but at the same time, the proximity to the major metro area, the proximity to Raleigh definitely helps because there is more than one news source here. Uh, you know, there's, there's radio, there's TV, there's newspapers, there are local blogs, uh, you know, there are people covering the state house, but it's not necessarily a way that you would like. And, and that's something that needs to be looked at in, you know, how do you get the news that's important to you? How do you find out what's happening down the street? But at the same time, make sure that you have the quality of coverage that you need that's, that's taking care of, of the state house and, and what's going on, uh, environmental stories, um, you know, the, those important, important stories. 
Yeah. And so, John, in your article yesterday, you were talking about um, you, you were making reference to stories that are spinach, or they, we used to refer to them as broccoli, but you know, pick your, your, your green vegetable. Um, and, and uh, you know, ink-stained traditionalists who, who want to see the, their meeting stories and want to read about it in the hard copy edition of the paper, et cetera. And you all have to move, move away from that. Um, but, in, and we understand, I think everyone, well, most of us are business people, and we kind of understand that. Most of you all are, anyway. Um, but, you know, where does that leave Garner? I mean, we're, we look around and we just, you know, we, we aren't seeing the coverage from what used to be the Garner Cleveland record and, and even in, in its digital version, you know, the, the, the coverage isn't there. Um, I, I know you're trying to build your brand on your state coverage and, and keep that strong and it's, it's, it's great. It's, you're providing great public service, but where does that kind of leave us? So the, the business model has changed. It used to be that um, the, you had enough uh, print advertising support to support a weekly or a twice weekly um, newspaper in Garner, which we published, as well as in nine other um, communities uh, around the Triangle. And once that advertising went away, we really lost the financial support for that, which also supported the reporter, who was the main writer for that publication. So from my perspective, I could assign a reporter to Garner, and now I know, through digital, I, I know um, all kinds of things about how much readership we have, which stories get read, how long people stay on those stories. It's pretty interesting. You, there's, a, there's a board called uh, Chartbeat in, in the, uh, our newsroom right now, and it and it will show you what the top 15 stories are at this moment, and the exact number of people who are reading the stories, and the average time that they spend on every story. So we have um, amazing um, analytics now, and so I could assign a reporter to Garner, or I could assign a reporter to a broader beat. So you can cover news by geography, or you can cover it by subject. But so let's just say. Um, I'll talk about two new beats that were that were created. One will be on um, K K twelve education across North Carolina, kind of statewide education issues. Another beat, new beat we're creating is on the faith community in the Triangle. So I could have a reporter write about Garner, or I could have a reporter on one of those other two beats, and the other two beats would get five to ten times the readership of the Garner beat. Now, as a journalist, we, you know, we want to reach as many readers as we can, and, um, uh, and that's you know, my primary interest. But also, as a business opportunity, um, if you're trying to build an audience and monetize your audience, you want a bigger audience, not a smaller audience. And, and this is not a close call. It's a dramatic difference in the amount of readership that I would get with a reporter covering Garner and the amount of readership we'd get with a reporter covering something like religion or other beats. Um, so uh, it's true that we're not, we don't have a reporter directly assigned to Garner, um, but we do have um, all kinds of other beats where Garner coverage is part of the beat. I mean, we cover Wake County Public Schools. Um, you know, we, we cover the Wake County Commissioners. Um, we cover all kinds of legislative issues. Um, so there will be some coverage of Garner in there, but it's not as specific as if we had one reporter covering Garner. Now, what we're going to try to do to fill in the gaps there is hire what we call stringers or correspondents. These are people who don't work full-time for the News and Observer. And we got a new kid here in Garner who I think is going to do pretty well for us. Um, and I think he's here. Tim Stevens here? Yeah. <laughs> So, you know, he, he's a little bit green, 40-some um, years at the NNO, and so Tim uh, will be our, our Garner correspondent, and um, so we hope that'll, you know, fill in the gaps a little bit. Okay. Um, it, you know, these days when people think about community journalism, there is there's what all comes to mind. You know, you cover a certain small geographical area, such as Garner. Um, but there's also communities of interest or communities of special interest. And it, with, with digital means, social media and, and blogging and stuff, it's, we have better capability these days of reaching these, these specialized communities. And Seth, that's, that's something that you have, some, some, have had some success in. Can you tell us 
how you've been able to build up that community uh, or, or that readership? Yeah, I mean, a lot of it has to do with just being consistent and you're, you know, you consistently have to put out um, a good product and I think that's true for any, you know, no matter how uh, big your readership is, but, you know, I think people gravitated towards what I was doing and then it kind of spread word of mouth um, and, you know, the social aspect of it, you know, it's kind of hard for people to, to even me to wrap my head around it. I look at it every day, but like just the power of, of being able to post something on Twitter or Facebook or something and have it reshared to thousands and thousands of people um, really can, can change the size and, and the type of your audience. So even from, if you can look at the demographics of my Twitter audience, it's predominantly male. Facebook's predominantly female. The website itself is 50-50, you know. Um, but we also have other channels that we kind of put, I hate the word content, but we kind of put, you know, content on, um, you know, like a private Facebook group that we have um, where you can kind of, uh, you know, share some, some stories that they may be interested in, and it's 95% women. So, you know, you kind of have to write for what your audience wants to, to read, to, to John's point. But... Um, you know, as long from what I've seen, as long as I continue to try to be clever and humorous and, and make light of certain you know topics, that's what people want to want to see. And uh, you know, somebody told me before I started this that you need to kind of stay away from the negativity, and um, and and I kind of went more positive with a lot of the stories, and that seemed to uh, to work well. And you know, you turn the local news on, and it's something's on fire, someone just got shot, so, you know, it's just so negative and, and I can see why people want to turn that off, but um, yeah, we've just tried to be entertaining and informative over the last year. The informative has started to come on more than just the entertaining, which is why we've got this development beat writer and he's writing about, you know, kind of everything in Raleigh. He's looking through all the permits that are pulled every week all the city council meeting minutes and agenda items and he'll send me the list of everything and I'll say, well, my audience doesn't really want to know about this RZ27 zone up change or whatever, but this building is going to get torn down and everybody used to love it and, you know, let's write about that. And um, while they're on the page reading about, you know, their favorite restaurant that got torn down, maybe they'll see, oh, this is an interesting, informative look at what's going on in the community on top of some you know, other kind of humorous stories. So it's kind of been an interesting mix over the last I don't know, seven or eight months. But I guess to answer your question, the, the biggest way that our site has grown is just through using these social tools like Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, things like that. So then I want to come back to, to, to John and Craig then. So, you know, for John, how are, how are you trying to use some of these tools to reach um, you know, the broader community, but maybe also some of these communities of special interest. Uh, and then, Craig, what, uh, you know, you talked about some of the emerging technologies and how newspapers might use them. Maybe you could talk about some of those that, that, that look promising. Uh, do you want to go first, John? Sure. So the, the radical change that we are, are adjusting to is how people consume information, and that is... Um, not just that mostly that's digital, but that they don't come directly to our website anymore. So in other words, they're getting their news through social media, uh, through Twitter, and especially through Facebook. So that means that we have to push the story out to the readers on Facebook. If we just post the story on our website, uh, it's not going to work for us because most of our digital traffic now, I already told you that most of our readership comes through digital, and most of our digital traffic comes through social media and search. So that means uh, the people who come directly to newsandobserver.com are a minority now, and that's getting smaller and smaller. So this means we have to develop strategies to reach people um, mostly on Facebook. 90% of our, our uh, social media readership is on Facebook. Um, and so we have to think about 
um, how we can reach communities of people on Facebook. And this is something that's really new for us. And uh, I was just talking about it in the last meeting I had before I came here an hour ago. Um, so when we, for example, right now, we have published online a series about um, deaths in North Carolina jails. It's being published online this week, and starting on Sunday, it'll be in print. So it used to be we would just put that series in the print paper and put it online, and that was the end of it. Well, that's just the beginning of it for us now. So we're brainstorming about, you know, how, who, what kind of groups would be interested in this story and would then put our story on their Facebook page or would then tweet about it on Twitter. This is a really big change for us. It's just a huge change in how, mostly younger people, how they consume their news. So Craig, what are, what are some of these technologies you all have been looking at and what, tell us what's promising? To, to just kind of build on, on what John was talking about, you know, uh, there's no doubt that Facebook and Twitter are, are huge in this game. Um, they, yeah, I mean, you really, as far as audience development, there's no better tool right now than Facebook or Twitter. Um, then you also get into the issues of, while it works for audience development, you know, you're not necessarily getting a, a huge revenue boost from, from doing that. You know, you're maybe driving people to the website, but there's that challenge of using those tools that are the hot new thing. You know, you have to do Facebook, you have to do Twitter, you have to be tweeting about it. You know, uh, every journalist has to be twe tweeting about what their story is. But there's not necessarily a bottom line influx there. So that's one of those tools that, that gets talked about and is really important, but also we want to look at things that, that will help the revenue. Um, and, and, you know, I mentioned like looking at VR, AI, uh, augmented reality, uh, artificial intelligence, those kind of things. And I, what we're seeing is they're, they're great tools. They can definitely be very immersive tools. But the one thing that we keep coming back to and uh, the innovation side of what we do really looks at uh, human-centered design um, and using that design thinking process. And the main key to that is figuring out what your audience wants. Like, what does the audience want? What is the audience going to drive to? And, you know, you might get some influx from 360 video or virtual reality, but is that, you know, really something to, to kind of bet the farm on? Maybe not. You know, right now it works for the New York Times has done a lot of 360 video. They've got some amazing stories. You know, they sent out Google Cardboard to their subscribers. They're getting a bunch of hits from that. But does that work in every community? You know, will it work in Garner? Maybe. Will it work in some of the more rural parts of North Carolina where they don't have broadband? You know, where cell signal is tiny if it's even there. You know, these are the kind of things that we want to look at in really helping, uh, you know, helping the NNO and helping some of these other organizations to look at, at what those tools are and whether or not it's still, you know, driving that, that community purpose that they have. Okay. Yeah, I want to ask a couple more questions or sets of questions um, that each of you all can, can dive in and, and answer. And then we're going to leave some time for audience questions. I figured that some people would have some questions. Um, so, so let's ask kind of these kind of you know, kind of open-ended or broad questions. You know, what what exactly can communities? Um, well, no, let's jump to this other one first. So we have a lot of business, uh, a lot of business owners, business people here. We have uh, a lot of local government officials represented. Um, I guess the question I wanted to, to ask have each of you all address is you know, what are the, some of the things that we can do, if anything, to support local journalism to, um, you know, get reestablished, if not reestablish community journalism the way it was, help, help forge some new future for it here in, in Garner. Thoughts? I'll, I'll make the plug. Is this, I'll make the plug to uh, buy some advertising from John. <laughs> um, <laughs> We take uh -huh. advertising as well. Yeah, and, and from Seth. Um, 
I mean, honestly, there's, you know, this, this has been the conversation for a long time, you know, that Main Street versus the big box store. It's the same thing with journalism. Uh, the big box store equivalent is Google and Facebook. Right now, they have all the, the digital revenue that John was talking about, the advertising. Facebook and Google have 64% of that. That doesn't leave a lot. That's in the nation. So that doesn't leave a lot for the local community. So when, as you look to spend your ad dollars, you know, think local. That's, I think that's one of the things that, that would help. Thoughts, Seth? <laughs> and also for you, Seth, like, do you have advice? Like uh, someone comes to you and says, how can, I, how can I get a blog started, Garner? How can I make it sustainable? How can I start to monetize it? thoughts about any of that? Yeah, I mean, we've kind of, the development beat is a good example because um, I had seen that written by a, a guy named James Borden, who's the guy who writes it, and he had written it for the Raleigh Public Record for, for years and done a really good job, and, and like I said, he'll dig through all the, the city permits and um, find a story and then write about it, and it would get picked up by the NNO or WRAL, you know, I, mean, I think he was the one that first broke something about um, maybe the old Rex Hospital being, being um, sold off or the Velvet Cloak being torn down or something like that. Um, and these are all interesting stories, but a lot of the times you're, you're going to run into some, some of this stuff that's not that interesting. So, um, you know, we kind of have started our own little development beat site in and of itself on ITB Insider because I think it was John said, you know, if I don't tell you to go read my website, you're probably not going to wake up and, and go to ITB Insider, you know, the first thing you do in the morning. You're going to see something that I post on Twitter or Facebook. And if I don't tell you to go look at that story that we just put up, you're probably not going to see it. Um, and so I think with the development beat, um, it's, it's, it could exist as a totally separate site. If, um, if we wanted it to. So if someone in Garner wanted to start a website, um, you know, it's, it's definitely doable. You just need to, to start it, start the social channels, be consistent, uh, cover things that people would, would want to read, and then hope the, hopefully your, your audience is going to grow uh, organically. You know, you'd obviously want to buy some, some Facebook ads and um, maybe ads elsewhere, but uh, mainly digital. And then, um, you know, that's when you prepare your media kit and ask advertisers, you know, how much they're willing to spend. So. And you, you've done, I mean, you have some advertisers on your site. Yeah, um, one of the reasons we brought over uh, James was because Rough D. Peden, they're a commercial builder, they were already sponsoring the site. And I said, well, James, if you want, I think he was writing it every day or something. And I said, well, why don't you just write it once a week on my site, and we'll talk with, to Ruffy Peden and see, see what they have to say about that. And we negotiated to get a, a better deal, and um, so now he writes basically five to ten stories that are just condensed into one story instead of us writing five to ten articles and telling you to, to read something that may not be as interesting on its own, but if it's mixed into five other stories, um, it's worth reading. So I've gotten a lot of feedback from people in commercial real estate, um, and people in general who I would not have thought would have read the site two years ago, they would say, I, I, I read this all the time now. So, um, you know, we, we approached them and they signed on for a, for a year deal and, and that was good to get it up and running. And, and then once that happened, you can figure out other ways, like the headline story spot, that costs a certain amount. You know, a, an ad, a display ad, halfway down costs a certain amount. So. Um, you know, once you have those eyeballs, it's pretty easy to show, you know, each of these posts is getting X amount of page views. Um, that's what this, this is worth to this audience. And, um, you know, the demographics of it all are just amazing. I can show you that, you know, like I said, you know, this channel is getting these type of readers in this income bracket. And, and you can really dig down um, into the data and see you know, who's reading what, and then take that to, to advertisers. Like the Raleigh Wine Shop, for instance, they should advertise on our private Facebook group that has 6,000 moms in it, you know? I mean, <laughs> that's a good spot for them to advertise, you know? But they probably wouldn't want to advertise on the development beat that's talking about, you know, another hotel is being built. So um, it's kind of like running a bunch of different websites under one brand. 
You may have heard the saying, where there is danger, there is opportunity. And honestly, I've had about all the opportunity I can stand the last 10 years. But when a market is disrupted, there is opportunity. And um, Seth has, what, what he just described doing is a lot harder than what it sounded like right there. Because there are thousands of people in this country in the last 10 years who have tried to do what you've done and ultimately couldn't make money and, and stopped doing it. And you are one of, if you're making money, uh, my hat's off to you because you are in a very small group of digital information startups who's figured out a way to make money. Um, there are a lot of interesting things going on. Um, there, are, there are some people who say, well, maybe news isn't really a for-profit industry. Maybe it should be a non-profit operation. And maybe the best solution for a place like Garner is to create a non-profit news organization where you, know, you, you raise $100,000 a year and you have a couple of reporters and you have a board of directors and you have a website. I, I don't think you could start a print newspaper in Garner and make money. I think, I think the startup costs, the barrier to entry are too high. Um, I do think, you know, the, the startup costs with digital are very, very low. I mean, basically, it's your labor costs. So, um, for $100,000, you, you know, a nonprofit could hire a couple of reporters and have a website. And, and maybe that's the future of um, local news in this country. I don't know, but that's, there are experiments going on like that. Well, I, I do want to ask one more question, then we'll, we'll turn to the audience. Um, you know, you talk about clo or making the, the lines cross the digital revenue line, the, the print revenue line, um, and you sounded optimistic, but it, there, there's still a gap, pretty big gap. And we have these great analytics now where you can see who's reading what and their, you know, what their interests are and everything, but it's really hard to, to, to monetize that, to, uh, like you said, to you know, start something like Seth has and, and make money. You know, how do we get there? How do you, how do you use these tools and the, the great analytics to really make those lines converge? I'm optimistic we're going to get there. I, I think we are, you know, um, not that far away. Now, I'm not, you know, I'm not the CEO of the company, and I don't have access to a lot of our um, financial data, but I do see the kind of broad trends, and I see this continued growth in our audience, and I see con our digital audience, and I see continued growth in our digital ad revenue, and so... Um, Nobody has really cracked the code, but clearly the bigger the audience that we have, the better chance you have of monetizing it. And so, um, you know, that, that's what we're trying to do. And I think that um, ultimately that we're, we're going to succeed because I, I believe that there is a market for um, local journalism. It may be different in different size communities, um, but I, I think that, um, that, that we're ultimately that we're going to make it work because I think that, um, that we do the journalism that we do, I think it has value and that people recognize it, ha it has value. And when all is said and done and we sort this out, I think that there will be a future for us. Cracking the code, are, are there any examples you can point us to, like what there's, newspapers that are really good? Yeah, there's well? a, lot of, uh, a lot of experimentation, as, as John mentioned, uh, that nonprofit model is one that has, uh, has kind of caught on. Um, I mean, I have the, I don't know, privilege, pain maybe of going to a bunch of journalism conferences throughout the year and, and kind of hearing the same speakers talk over and over again. But really talking about kind of unlocking it and figuring out what that is. But so there's a lot of, a lot of experimentation in that, the nonprofit side of things. There's also events are a big one that a lot of news organizations are, are doing. Um, you know, some of the digital startups have found a lot of success in, in coming up with these events. And they work out both as fundraisers, but also as audience engagement. And, you know, really getting people to buy into that organization and, and really feeling like a community uh, with that news source. So those are some of the things that are, are kind of working that, that we're hearing are working. Um, it's, yeah, unfortunately, no one has, has figured out what that magic bullet is yet, but we're all, 
we're all trying and, and there's a lot of things. Um, what it really comes down to is the one thing is just diversification of revenue and, and figuring out what beyond subscriptions and advertising there is. Because if one of those drops off, like subscription rates are, are dropping faster than advertising rates. So, you know, what's, what's gonna come in next? And, Okay, I think we're going to turn to the audience. Uh, I presume some people came with questions. Yes, sir, right here. With the move to more digital, are you finding it is new readers that are coming on board with the digital, or are you simply shifting the old print readers over to digital, and how would that impact people wanting to maybe do some advertising? You know, for us, um, there, there are some shifting uh, of old, of um, previous print readers to digital, but I think a lot more of it is people who have just changed their reading habits. So I, I think it, I think it's probably a combination. Um, but we are able to reach a lot more people. But as I described before, it's more on a story by story basis. And so recently, when the um, that there was that power outage at the Outer Banks. Uh, I, I think we broke that story, and the initial story had um, more than 900,000 different people read that story, which is pretty amazing, you know? I mean, we never had, uh, even, even at the height of our readership in print paper, there were never anywhere near 900,000 people who read a story in the print um, NNO. So I think it's, I don't know for sure the answer to your question, but I think it's more of our reaching um, new readers. Um. Okay. Neil, we're uh, a little bit short on time. Mr. Kennedy? Yes, sir. Mr. Treasurer, I was interested in your comment about using analytics. Um, probably a somewhat of a cynical question, but in reality, I, I, I truly would like to know, maybe it would tell us all something. What are your analy analytics telling you that to expand your restaurant coverage and also to the point that you put a recipe on the front page of the News and Observer. And it sounds cynical and negative and that, but who, 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 is, who, wants, who wants that as opposed to somebody that's my age? And the second part of the question is, what do you tell us as the, as the last generation in here, the silent generation, what do you tell us about where we're going to get our news from and how we've got to convert? So the first question about food is that, um, with all due respect, I think this might be a generational thing. And what has happened in the last 10 years is that uh, the triangle, uh, in Raleigh specifically, has exploded in terms of being um, a place for good restaurants. And, and the NNO food coverage has changed dramatically to something that was based on recipes and is much more now based on restaurants and chefs. I mean, chefs, we have celebrity chefs now in the triangle. And this is a high readership area for us on digital. So um, our food coverage has, uh, it, it drives a lot of digital readership. Um, you know, downtown Raleigh looks a lot different now than it did 10 years ago. Um, and, you know, I think that's mostly a good thing. People like Smee York, who I, who I saw here earlier, worked, you know, for decades to try to get the kind of downtown that Raleigh has now. But food is a really big part of that. So food is a big part of our coverage now, um, which is a big change from previous years. So the data, the, data, the data shows high interest in that. For traditional newspaper readers, you know, I, I, there have been all kinds of... Um, uh, estimates as to how long print newspapers will last, I have no idea what the answer to that question is. As long as we can uh, still make money on it, then you know we'll do it. Uh, ultimately, uh, I report to a publisher who is in charge of the business operation of the newspaper. You're probably aware that in some American cities, even some pretty big cities, um, New Orleans, for example, the, the print newspaper is only three times a week. And um, who knows where we'll end up. Our Sunday print paper still does really well, and uh, there are some people who think that we're, where we'll end up is um, digital only during the week with some kind of Sunday print newspaper or magazine. Uh, how many more questions do you want to take, Neil? Do you want to keep going for a little bit? Maybe do one more. I'm happy to stay here for all. Maybe all one more. Yes, ma'am, in the back. Or, or, yes, ma'am. 
can't not speak. Um, I'm hoping the chamber will follow up this session with another meeting at some point of you members here. I know a lot of you here, and I know you remember how wonderful it was to get a 24 paper Garner News with education news, sports, somebody covering town hall and what all you guys are up to, no offense intended. And, and we miss that. Uh, we miss um, legitimizing what our children are doing with honor rolls and reports to, uh, about their successes in the high school level and on to college. And what you've told us today really doesn't answer any of that, except for a couple of suggestions. One, a nonprofit online paper, or someone starting an online paper. And those are, are questions that have to be asked right here in this room with the leaders here, and where would we go next? Um, the question, is Garner becoming a news desert, I think has been answered, and the answer is uh, no, but the coverage of the news uh, it, it is missing. There's plenty of news here, it's just missing, and we all miss it. Did, raise your hand if you miss the news, the local news. So, okay, so um, I'm a teacher now, and uh, I just left some 14 year olds. Uh, so I'm, I'm, I really am impressed by this panel. You guys have really opened my eyes a lot to uh, not to fantasize anymore about a print medium coming out in Garner because that, that may not be the right thing. Although, uh, the Southern Pines pilot and the news reporter down in Columbus County, those are examples of vibrant, uh, I, I don't know how much money they make. They're mom and pop, they're not corporate owned, so that might make a difference. Um, but, but uh, we, okay, so we're going to go online and um, Tim Stevens will be the editor. Uh, you know, I, I just really would love to see the chamber continue the conversation. That's it. Thank you, gentlemen, for, for being here for us. Thank you. And just FYI, that was from the former editor of the Garner News back in his heyday. <laughs> All right, are we going to wrap up? So, um... I, I think we do need to continue the conversation because uh, you know, we all know that uh, you need to have an independent, credible, and comprehensive news source in your community. Uh, it can't be the government alone telling you what to think and what's happening because even though we're, we're competent and honest and transparent, you, you know, it, it helps to have an independent set of eyes out there. And, and, they, and frankly, they can go out and cover, uh, independent news can cover stuff that, that a town hall communication shop just can't or won't for ethical or practical reasons. Um, so let's continue the conversation and maybe there's a, a, an entrepreneur out there or, or a, a budding young writer who'd wanna start something. Thank you. We, uh, Neil, I'm told that I, I was supposed to read this. It's break time, is that right? It's break time. It's break time. Uh, thank you, Strategic Behavioral Center. Uh, and uh, please visit with our exhibitors and we'll reconvene at four. Four o'clock.